Thank you. I'll, I'll keep it very short because the main act follows me. It's fun to be a warm-up act for, a, for, an, for an icon, the, 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 the kind of uh, giant and prophetess. Uh, I asked her if it was okay if I called her a prophetess. She said it's okay. Um, <laughs> Our world, our world desperately needs more prophets and prophetess as prophetess as um, <clears throat> prophetai. Uh -oh. It's great to be with you this evening and great to uh, see such a great turnout. <clears throat> I would like to uh, kind of warm up for uh, Dr. Vandana Shiva with the idea that um, that we live in a time when our orthodoxies are as strange as our forebears who lived in a time when uh, the orthodoxy was, for example, uh, that the earth was flat. Imagine living in a time when uh, the orthodoxy was the earth is flat and you're the one person that says, um, I think it's round. Now, uh, when we look throughout history, what we find is that generally those, those um, those weirdos, for the most part, were actually historically shown to be correct, you know, over time. And uh, so the weirdos, when the orthodoxy was the earth is flat, guess what? You know, they were, they were shown uh, that they, they were right, uh, or the earth is round. Um, how about that the sun revolves around the earth? You know, well, of course the sun doesn't revolve around the earth. The earth revolves around the sun. We know that today. But there was a day when you would have been marginalized, demonized, accused of being a strange person, you know, when you said, what do you mean? We, we, watch the, we watch the sun come up every morning. It sets, you know, it rises in the east and sets in the west. And you can see it come up. It goes over. Of course it revolves around the earth. I mean, you know, this is typical. Um, you know, there was a time, uh, there was an orthodoxy when, you know, Universally, it was agreed slavery is fine. And, um, and now we understand this probably not. There was a time when the orthodoxy was, if you're sick, there's something wrong with your humors. And we need to uh, uh, bloodlet to get the humors out of you, get all those bad things out of you. You know, the, the blood was part of the humors. We're moving closer, you know, it, moving closer in history. Think about that uh, the orthodoxy of our day for, you know, 30 years was um, uh, growing cattle by feeding dead cows to cows. This was the orthodoxy. And farmers like me who dared to say uh, this is not a good idea were um, laughed into uh, oblivion by the PhD academic elitists and the industrial foodists of our, uh, of our culture. We, I was branded a Luddite, a, a barbarian, a Neanderthal. What do you want to do? Go back to hoop skirts and, and um, you know, washboards and <clears throat> backwards. Uh, that might sound romantic if you've never done it, but. And then, you know, after 30 years, there was this kind of big universal suddenly, oops, maybe we shouldn't ought to done that, <laughs> when bovine spongiform encephalopathy reared its ugly head and nature did indeed bat last. And today we have an orthodoxy that GMOs will feed the world. And so we take millennia of historical protocol and we in 30 days, do a geriatric rat feeding trial and stamp approved equivalent as on it and send it into the world's population. This is the orthodoxy of our day. So, very quickly, I want to just give you a couple of, of big ones just to get you thinking as uh, Dr. Shiva comes up and shares with us her uh, take on some of these orthodoxies. For example, we have an orthodoxy today that Nature is broken and we have to fix it. I mean, that's kind of the assumption. Nature's broken and we have to fix it. You know, in our neck of the woods in Virginia there in the U.S., when our neighbors, who, by the way, don't wish they were like us, they wish that we were gone, um, they called me a bioterrorist in my community. <laughs> a typhoid Mary. Because they really believe 
that my unvaccinated, unmedicated, un, uh, you know, uh, uh, what free ranging chickens are going to commiserate with a red winged blackbird and take my diseases to the scientific Tyson environmentally controlled chicken houses and kill all their chickens, and everybody in Thailand and Bosnia that gets American chicken is going to starve to death because my chickens gave a red-winged blackbird avian influenza. <laughs> I mean, this is the reality. They, they, they don't dislike me because they want to dislike me. They dislike me because they're actually fearful about their future. So when one of their animals gets sick, their first thought is, oh, that one must be um, pharmaceutically disadvantaged. You know, I didn't use the right drug. You know, if, if their plant gets sick, they assume that they didn't use the right herbicide, the right pesticide, the right insecticide. When I have a sickness in a plant or an animal, my first assumption is, what did I do to mess up nature? Our position is the default position of nature, nature's default position is wellness, fundamental wellness. And if it's broken and not working, I probably broke it. And I find that I learn a lot more about me, about ecology, about community and life when I assume that if it ain't working, it's my fault. That's the place of humility to come. And of, of course, an ancillary part of that is that life is fundamentally mechanical. That's another orthodoxy of our day. And so nobody asks, does it matter if the pig can express its pigness? The only question is, can we grow them faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper? And we all know that that's not a very good goal because the, that's why the average uh, NFL football player is dead at 57 because when your neck is bigger than your head, you're a freak and nature weeds you out. Next orthodoxy of our day is that efficiency requires monospeciation. You can't have a bunch of intermingled plants and animals and aquatic plants and arable plants and perennials and annuals and you can't mix these things up. Well, that's a, that, 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 that's a, a, a cacophony of inefficiency. <laughs> and the heretics dare to suggest diversity and multispeciation are actually far more productive per square yard than the most amazing uh, GMO monospeciation you can imagine. Variety is beautiful and functional. And our farm and food system should be aesthetically and aromatically sensually romantic. <laughs> because beautiful diversified foodscapes our foodscapes that attract our children. And if it attracts our children, then it's right. And if you have to put on a hazmat suit and walk through sheep dip to go visit your food, it's not very attractive. <laughs> Third orthodoxy of our day, home kitchens are unnecessary. Who needs a kitchen? You just go to Kohl's or Woolworth's, buy the single ingredient, you know, little microwavable SKU numbered barcode cellophane wrapped package, pop it in and graze through the day. When the, when the son wants to eat, he pops his portion in. When the daughter wants to eat, she pops her portion. When mom wants to eat, she pops her portion in. When dad wants to eat, he pops his portion in. And you just kind of, you just kind of wander through the day like a bunch of, you know, homeless pigeons <laughs> scavenging crumbs from the industrial larder. The heretic dares to say to this orthodoxy, as the heretic, you know, gets put on the rack, no, home centricity is the foundation of integrity food. And when we take food out of the home, we take the preparation, packaging, processing, and preserving out of the home. What we do is profoundly abdicate the human from historically normal participation with the food system, which creates an ignorant person, which creates a fearful person, which creates a paranoid person. 
because we fear the things we don't understand. And so when we don't participate with the food, we actually have fear. And then the other orthodoxy, the techno-sophisticated Western civilizations are under a divine dispensation that makes us immune from collapse. And so we assume that we can make water when it doesn't rain. We assume that we can make immune systems out of chemicals. We assume that we can make health out of hospitals. And we can solve food deserts with dented cans from the industrial truck that fell off. Heretics dare to say the Chinese proverb, if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to end up where you're headed, is probably true. And it takes the prophet who says, let me warn you about where we're going and offer you a way out. There are a lot of orthodoxies, but I won't bore you with all of them. I mean, there's the orthodoxy that fewer farms are better. The corollary is that farmers are intellectually challenged and smart people don't farm. Farming is for intellectually disadvantaged and it's, it, helps, it helps if you're intellectually disadvantaged. It also helps if your skin isn't white. Then you can be a farmer. And that's why I promote the Jeffersonian intellectual agrarian, that it's time to elevate farming as a vocation to a place of our best and brightest, because that is how we will steward our air, soil, and water to its ultimate ability. There's another orthodoxy that food should be cheap. And so we have a very fundamentally cheap food policy. And life is fundamentally mechanical. These are all orthodoxies that probably the single most powerful voice in the world that dares to challenge these as a heretic and gradually as an earth changer is Dr. Vandana Shiva. The first time I heard her, I said, whoa, here is somebody who shakes the earth, who shakes policy, who, I didn't say shape, I said shakes. And before you shape, you have to shake. Because it's the, it's the trembling of where we are and the path out of it that creates a pattern for change. And so it is with great pleasure that I introduce one of my mentors, one of my favorite uh, people who has had a profound effect on me, my thinking, my understanding, who challenges me spiritually, intellectually, physically, and on my farm to do it better, Dr. Van Danashiva. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joel. And even though it does look like Joel's visiting the Navdanya farm in Derudun, that's just the brilliant digital work of the <laughs> organizers. And I hope one day you will be able to make it to Navdanya. Uh, I want to thank the organizers uh, for uh, working together to put this uh, gathering together and a lovely title because we are usually not conscious that the planet is always on our plate. Um, we have a b b beautiful ancient Upanishad that says, everything is food. Everything is something else's food. And in the food that comes to our plate are in space and in time, all the relationships that ever were that made it. The relationships in the soil, of geological processes that gave the minerals, of all the organisms, the earthworm, which Darwin said would be the most significant species when human history would be written. 
in terms of what it contributes. He wrote a little booklet called The Mold, um, The Mycorrhizae, and for this beautiful continent, I would add the Aboriginal people. Every morsel you eat is a gift from them. The last time I was in Sydney, I was here for the Festival of Dangerous Ideas. And they gifted me a book which I read on the way back. It's a very fat book. And the title of the book is The Largest Estate on Earth. And it's basically showing that this continent was managed as a garden, not as a bush. So I think it would be good for all Australians to start talking about their continent as a garden, because bush is something you use so frequently, isn't it? Um, and in every morsel we eat is all of evolution, <laughs> biological and cultural. In it are the diversity of species and the further diversification by the farmers who today are called intellectually challenged, but have given us the 99.9% .9 breeding that supports our food system. Um, Indian farmers gave us 200,000 varieties of rice. In Navdanya, we've rescued and saved about 3,000. Most of the foods humans have eaten, and humans have eaten more than 8,500 species. Most of them were first driven out by the 12 commodities that were traded globally. And now that our seeds are genetically engineered, and the only reason seeds are genetically engineered is to collect a royalty from every acre. That's the only objective. Everything else is good spin. Now, because there are only four crops that they've been able to commercialize with ge genetic engineered traits, and only two traits after all these years, only two sad traits. Bt toxin, so that the plant becomes its own pesticide factory, and herbicide tolerant, the Roundup Ready crops. So you have four crops, corn, soya, canola, cotton, with two traits. And here are farmers who have, here's, here's, the, here's nature first, who's given us all the tremendous species. And then there are farmers who took grasses, the teosinte, gave us the corn and the diversity. Although Raisa Sativa, the parent of Indian rices. And no two varieties are the same. No variety has only one trait. All our breeding was for straw and grain in cereals, so that the straw would go to animals and the soil, and we'd eat the grain, and some of it we'd see, keep for seed. We've tried, because of this orthodoxy that nature is deficient, and other species don't have needs, the entire green revolution the objective was how do you move war chemicals into agriculture? Story that was never told. It was always, always about feeding the world. And then because native species have been evolved to maximize biomass, not grain, they changed the partitioning to make what were called dwarf varieties. And these dwarf varieties then got rid of the store. So you had nothing to recycle back to the soil. You had no animal fodder. You had grain, and that to a monoculture grain. And the only reason this was done is because the traditional tall varieties, when they were fertilized with synthetic fertilizers, had a problem of lodging. So to get rid of that lodging, they made them dwarf. Did they invent the dwarf gene? No, they didn't. The wheat was taken from Japan during the war, Norin, and the rice was taken from Indonesia. <coughs> then it was crossed. And yet,
we've always been told that these were miracles created by Norman Borlaug, who was even given a Nobel Peace Prize for the chemicals. And he called them miracle seeds. And he trained 12 people to spread this chemical package around the world. And he had the arrogance to call them his 12 apostles. Well, I didn't really get trained in university in agriculture. My university training is in physics. My PhD is in the foundations of quantum theory. And already that training uh, equipped me well to get rid of the mechanical orthodoxy. And the mechanical orthodoxy assumes that everything is a hard billiard ball. And the only way they have impact on another billiard ball is through impact and violent action and direct action. And um, uh, there's certainty. You can predict exactly where that billiard ball will move according to Newton's laws of motion. And then we get quantum theory that shows nothing is immutable. Newton even said God made the world in terms of immutable billiard balls. And because the same particle can become a wave, nothing is certain. So living with uncertainty becomes vital. But most importantly, and to me the two big lessons of quantum theory that helped me get totally liberated from the mechanical philosophy is first the idea of non-separability, that everything is connected. Even in physics we've learned that, and in biology of the, that's feeding industrial agriculture and genetic engineering, they're so trying so hard to keep a hundred-year-old orthodoxy alive of separation. The second in physics, in quantum physics is, because everything's evolving and there are no hard mutable, immutable balls, the world is really a world of potential. And potential depends on the context. So if farmers are respected in society and given a just price and allowed to learn from the earth and from their ancestors and from each other, we have systems that make farming viable, sustainable, respectable. And when you have an unjust system of pushing chemicals and seeds on farmers, farmers are turned into consumers, costs of production shoots up, then you have a globalized system based on so-called free trade, but the real part of that system is the $400 billion subsidy, a billion dollars a day, to push the prices down. And then you wonder why agriculture is becoming unviable. So since everything is potential, including the seed, including our children, including our society, it's creating the context for the unfolding of that potential that matters. So when I started Navdani and I started to save seeds, and I started it because after my work on the Green Revolution, I started to get called for agriculture meetings and biotechnology meetings. And since I really deeply believe in permanent learning, I would go really to learn what's happening now. So I went to a biotechnology meeting, 1987, before any commercialization. And the industry that had brought us the war chemicals, had made them into agrochemicals, was now saying, got to own the seed. Our only source of profits is ownership of seed. And the only way we can lay claim of ownership is through patenting. And the only way we can claim a patent is through genetic engineering because by then the tools of recombinant DLA were available in the public domain. And then they even said it's not good enough for us to capture US and Europe, which was the industrial agriculture market for seed. Most of the world had farmers varieties, India, till WTO and globalization, 80% of our seeds were in farmers' hands. And they said, got to make sure these patent laws apply worldwide. And they wrote an intellectual property rights treaty in the GATT, which became the WTO. And Monsanto is on record saying, we were the patient, diagnostician, and physician all in one in writing this treaty. We, 
and what, what was their dis illness? They, they were ill because farmers saved seeds. And what was the prescription to cure them of the illness? Now it should be illegal for farmers to save seed. When I heard them, I said, this is unacceptable because every species has integrity. And for me, seed freedom is the freedom of each variety, each species to evolve into the future. It's the freedom and the duty of farmers to save seeds. So we take a very simple pledge in Navdanya. That we have received this diversity and these seeds from nature and our ancestors, and it is our duty to save them and share them. And therefore, we will not obey any law that comes in the way of this higher duty. And from the beginning, 1987 onwards, not only have we personally not accepted patenting of seed and patenting of life, we've made sure that in India, our laws don't recognize it. And for those of you who work with Steve Marsh, I would say add the intellectual property component to that issue. I don't think it's enough to say he's an organic farmer who lost his organic status. The more serious issue is canola, which was never invented by Monsanto, all they did was put a toxic gene into it to express toxic traits. Roundup resistance in particular, but also antibiotic resistance markers and viral promoters, that if at all they've done something new, it's that bundle of toxic genetic traits. And in any environmental issue, the principle is the polluter get, is polluter must pay what Monsanto's done with Percy Smizer in Canada and Steve March here is saying the polluter gets paid. And they've said in Percy's case, the way we'll take over, given the resistance against GMOs, is through contamination. So there are two issues related to this. One, it's because they've defined this as the intellectual property. The seed isn't. The next generation of seed isn't. But those toxics are theirs. They've added those. They didn't create life. Life is not a manufacture. But adding toxics is a human act. And I won't go into the details of Bauman versus Monsanto, where a farmer who bought grain from an elevator and planted it, he was sued by Monsanto. And the Supreme Court of the US upheld the Monsanto case, saying any reproduction of a seed in a farmer's field that is patented, uh, a seed that's patented, is the theft of a self-replicating machine. It's a machine, the seed. Now there's also in international law, and I was appointed by the UN to be an expert in framing the biosafety laws globally under the Convention on Biological Diversity. That convention uh, of biodiversity had Article 19.3 under which we got the biosafety protocol. There is an additional protocol on liability. We haven't done our homework. We haven't taken this international law on liability of damage and harm to biodiversity and converted it into movements because no law comes without movement building. So rather than Steve fighting a defensive fight, I think in Australia, in India, in the United States, everywhere, we really should give a call. No patents on seed. Monsanto, you did not invent the seed. You anyway are not a person, even though you pretend to be. You don't have a mind. Therefore, you can't have intellectual property in products of the mind. <laughs> and of course, all the food we eat embodies in it the hydrological cycle, the water footprint. There's so much discussion now on the virtual trade in water with the export of water and the import of drought in arid areas. 
And the air. I mean, the air is what connects us. Breath. Pranayam. Prana. Life. That is what breath is. And for those who've been through pranayam and yoga training, you I don't know if you've been through the fact that you say so hum. Hum. Yeah? So you are, therefore I am. If you weren't there, I wouldn't be. That's the world of interconnectedness. That's the world of non-separability. And in a world of balance and ecological relationship, we put out carbon dioxide, the trees and all the plants give us oxygen and the cycle goes on. But when you move to a fossil fuel base in agriculture, we can start pouring more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere than the biosphere can absorb, which is why we get climate change. Nitrogen circulates. You take fossil fuels, fire them at 400 degrees centigrade, turn it into synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, and apply it on farms. That gives you nitrogen oxide 300 times more lethal in climate instability than carbon dioxide. So 40% of climate instability, I don't call it climate change because climate change makes you believe it's all going to move like this. No, it moves like that. You don't know when it's be going, going to be cold and the average temperatures are increasing. But the extreme events is what destroys agriculture. The extreme flood, the extreme drought, the extreme cyclone, and the more frequent occurrences. So in my book, Soil Not Oil, I worked out on the basis of IPCC data that 40% of all greenhouse gases contributing to climate change are coming from industrial globalized farming. And with regenerative farming, we really have in our hands a system that could take all that additional carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turn it into soil fertility. But for that, we'd have to do the work on the principle of the law of return, of giving back, which can only come from the recognition that we received. That the food we eat is the distillation of all the nutrition recycling. Geological time, yesterday, today, and I would add the potential for tomorrow. Because the way we are harming the future is first by destroying the planet's capacity to support us. If you look at biodiversity, the United Nations Plant Genetic Resources Conference has said 75% gone because of industrial monocultures. 75% water is abused and polluted in industrial agriculture. I've grown up in an India pre-green revolution in my young childhood. Our water anywhere was at 10 feet. 10 feet. And 75% of our land is anyway what is called rain-fed. You have to grow crops without irrigation. The only way you can grow crops without irrigation is if your soil is your water reservoir. And the only way your water reservoir in the soil increases is through organic matter and humus. When you destroy that, you can irrigate any amount and you're going to need more water. Chemical farming requires 10 times more water than native crops and organic farming. That's why dams are being built everywhere. Groundwater is being mined everywhere. And then the water that comes out, I mean, in organic farms, I know the council, city council of Munich pays organic farmers around Munich to do organic farming. So the water they received has been filtered through organic soils. In chemical farming, it's loaded with herbicides, glyphosate, pesticides, and it's more costly for councils to pull those pesticides out those nitrates from nitrogen fertilizer, and 70% nitrogen fertilizer runs off, 
goes into water bodies and is creating dead zones everywhere. If you look at the UNEP data on dead zones, every year the area where the ocean is dead is increasing. So soil, water, biodiversity, 75% destroyed. And the argument is, this is all done to increase food production. Are we increasing food production? Look at the data. Only 30% of the food humans eat comes from large industrial farms. 70% comes from small farms and gardens. And I don't think the FAO, which did this assessment, assess, assessed all the gardens. They assessed you know, the more sort of documented gardens. Now a system that is 30% of your food supply and is destroying 75% of the planet, all you have to do is try and make it 45% of your food supply and you've got a dead planet. An impossible project. The single biggest reason why we got to shift to an agriculture that works within the ecological limits of the renewal of fertility and water. And those limits actually allow you to enhance your productivity. Because the arrogance of that mechanical mindset is also an arrogance of, I call it capitalist patriarchy, the idea that everything has to be conquered and controlled. And that idea of control is constantly driving an agriculture based on control which goes out of control. Yeah. You think you're going to control the pests and you bring the war mentality, you know, kill everything living. Every insect is a pest. Not only do you create more pests, You create resistant pests, you create resistant weeds. Um, in the US, super weeds have just taken over. And Joel was saying that uh, every farmer is putting aside $100 for paying manual labor to deal with weeds that can't be controlled anymore. So the, m the more you try and deny the r fact that there are laws of nature, and our most sophisticated work is to work according to those laws and not against them. The orthodoxy is. The only laws that exist are the ones we cook up. The laws of a free market, there's nothing like a free market. A market with intellectual property rights, $400 billion subsidy, threats, wars, trade wars, secret tribunals of the TPP. That's not free trade. That's coercive trade. And coerc coercion in the hands of five corporations. In other times when we could speak more normally, we'd just call it dictatorship. <laughs> now coming back to the GMO orthodoxy, as I said, the four crops, two traits, one corporation controlling most of the GM seeds sold anyway, only to collect royalties. Monsanto produces no seed. Monsanto does no agriculture. All it does is lock local companies into licensing arrangements and appropriate the genetic wealth of the world and collect rents and royalties from farmers. In the US, I did a rough calculation on the basis of the royalties they collect. It's 10 billion just for the technology fees. In India, the revenue and rent collection made the price of seed go so high, and uh, I won't go into details of how the alternatives were destroyed, but it pushed cotton farmers into debt. 95% of the cotton seed became Monsanto's monopoly and more than 291,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide since the days this globalization process allowed Monsanto to start taking over the Indian market. And that's why we've started a whole new program in cotton where we've saved native cotton seeds, we do organic training. I was visiting our farmers the other day and 
one farmer took me so proudly to his field, he said, that half is all BT, because I was a BT cotton farmer, which is the uh, GMO cotton. But this half is seeds I brought from the Navdanya Community Seed Bank. Already, and he says, the harvest is not over. Already with half the harvest, I've doubled the output from my native cotton. So the idea that farmers don't have brains, nature doesn't have intelligence, is constantly counted when you allow nature and farmers to work. Uh, you know, they call farmers' varieties primitive varieties, primitive. Inferior. And the industrial varieties are, of course, always superior and improved. And in Borlaug's case, miracles. <laughs> and in the case of Monsanto inventions. So for people who can't understand the complication of antibiotic resistance markers and viral promoters, etc., and they get confused, and what's that and what's that? I say, okay, in future, just remember, GMO means God move over. Because the only reason, only reason GMOs are being pushed is royalty collection. Uh, because the BT has failed to control pests and the herbicide tolerant, Roundup resistant, has failed to control weeds, their next round is to push these uh, biofortification products. One is called golden rice. Started 2000, in the year 2000. I wrote an essay, Blind Approach to Blindness Prevention. Blindness to biodiversity that gives us hundreds of percent more vitamin A. Now, of course, you have your own Dr. Dale of the GMO banana fame. Now, interesting thing is, Dr. Dale's story is different each place I read it. The, we started a campaign in India because he went on TV, American, uh, Australian Broadcasting Corporation, saying, um, I'm going to save Indian women from dying in childbirth because of iron deficiency. I'll increase iron content in banana. Bananas have 0.44 milligrams of iron. You begin with amaranth, you begin with turmeric, you begin with other things which are rich, rich in iron, which have 7,000% more iron. <laughs> and he said he'd do, golden, he'd do a banana with vitamin A for Uganda. It says, because they eat only banana. Yes, they eat banana for their energy and starch. But that doesn't mean they don't eat vegetables. So Adam is here in the audience. And Adam did very quick research and found out that the beta carotene trait in what Dale claims to be his invention through genetic engineering was pirated from Pacific bananas, indigenous Pacific bananas, that have been used in nutrition programs. And a scientist had worked on these beta carotene rich, and all that Dale did was steal that research. And then go through the gymnastics of genetic engineering to make it look like magic got created. Now, because we build a campaign on the iron rich, suddenly India is about disease resistance. They keep changing. Now the iron has also moved to Uganda. And they were going to do trials in Iowa State. 12 students paid $900 each to eat three to four bananas. Because <laughs> we built up the campaign, we built up the movement, and they're suddenly saying, okay, we are going to hold the trials for a while. My reading of those trials was, no, they are not. No one can test in a few months and four bananas, what's happening to the health of people. It wasn't about safety. It was about commercialization. And it was basically about colonialism. That now we will tell the Africans, we've eaten it, so you'd better eat it. And then Mr. Gates, who's financing Mr. Dale, would have got together and pushed every development agency and aid agencies to say, that's the only banana that will be distributed through all the aid money of the world. That's how all this works. So you've created nutritionally empty food that's loaded with toxics. And then you say you're going to bring nutrition. I want to just share with you, we, what we've started to do is measure nutrition per acre. Because that's what matters, not the mass per acre. Mass of, that's empty of nutrition is part of mechanical philosophy. Mass is a primary quantity 
in mechanical physics. In the real ecology of life, its quality, its taste, its aroma, its nutrition, all of that is a primary quality. And how fat the apple was is a derivative quality, quantity. And quantity anyway, like I said, in the quantum world, it's all about quality, not quantity. Quantity must, by its very nature, go hand in hand with monocultures. So I'll just share with you, very roughly, very quickly, just one simple farming system in my region. How much protein, the difference in a biodiverse farm versus a monoculture, 338 versus 90 protein, carotene. All the work on golden rice, vitamin A rich bananas, our fields provide 2,540 units of beta carotene against 24 in a monoculture. All you have to do is grow the biodiversity. You don't need the genetic engineering. Folic acid, vital for pregnant women, 554 versus zero. Calcium, 3,000 3, versus 120. Zinc, I want to read this out to you because it's um, 41,000 versus 16,000. And uh, Penny Caldicott, who is a public health specialist in Melbourne, had come to visit us and when she saw the work we do, and she said, so many of the young teenagers and adolescents in Australia are getting into depression. And her biochemistry analysis of brain functions has shown most of them have zinc deficiency. Because zinc is not even in the vocabulary of industrial agriculture. You have NPK, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, because they can come from factories. The soil becomes deficient in micronutrients and terrace elements. The plants become deficient, our diets become deficient. And so many of the illnesses today are linked to these trace element and micronutrient deficiencies. And other illnesses are related to the toxics in the food. Cancers, autism, 1.8 million children in the US have learning disability now. 15% babies are being born with neurological development disorders. Just in the last few years, 300% jump in autism. And according to the Center for Disease Control, one in two children in the US will be autistic. And scientists are connecting this to the, the complex of Roundup and GMOs. And they're actually analyzing the processes through which the connection between our gut and our brain is being disrupted. The minerals we need for the enzymes that release the chemicals that help our brain functions, they are being destroyed. So just like our soil was destroyed, the biodiversity of our gut is being destroyed. And through it, the future of our children. Now, in, a, in India, we always said, Think of the seventh generation to come before you act. And you know, we know Monsanto's irresponsible, but I think of a government which would allow 50% of its future generations to be sacrificed for the profits, short-term profits of one company. How could it have come? So the choice is very clear for us. Either our plates that connect to the planet in ways that respect the earth and the soil and the seed and the water and the atmosphere and minimize our footprint by increasing food production. Our work has shown that we produce more food, we could feed to India through biodiversity intensification. We've done wealth per acre 1.2 trillion is the externality of a chemical system that people bear through pollution, through dis disappearance of species, through the farmers' suicides. On the other hand, with their own seeds and ecological agriculture, our farmers are earning 10 times more. So this is the answer to hunger by growing more food and healthier food. It's the answer to disease and it's the answer to poverty because the entire industrial system is based on what I call the law of extraction. You extract the fertility from the soil, 
and leave desertified soils. You extract the wealth of the farmers and leave rural communities impoverished. You extract the health of our children. But there is another law of return we can obey. And that law of return is of ecological return to the soil, of equity and respect for the farmers to make sure they get a full share. The, the globalized industrialized model allows 1% allows or 2% to return to the farmer in terms of the consumer dollar. But then the industry takes out 10 times more. So it's a negative economy. It's a negative economy in energy terms. 10 kilocalories go to produce one kilocalorie of food, when ecologically we could have one kilocalorie producing 10 kilocalories. That's the way out of every crisis we face. But there's also a political law of extraction. And that political law of extraction is leave people powerless and without democratic rights. And I just want to show, share with you a few of the more recent um, ways in which this is functioning, besides issues like globalization and uh, WTO and Trans-Pacific Partnership. So one aspect, as I said, is criminalizing our highest duty, which is saving seed. We fought these laws through a satyagraha, Gandhi's word for the force of truth. They tried it in India in 2004, and I told the prime minister and built a movement with 100,000 representations from farmers and said, we're in the land of Gandhi. Gandhi taught us that unjust law must not be obeyed because obeying unjust law is a guarantee for slavery. And freedom demands that we adhere to higher law, to not obey unjust law. And we learned this in the SALT Satyagraha from Gandhi. So we do the seed satyagraha. And that law could never be implemented in India of making local seed saving illegal. In the US, three seed libraries have been sued. And they've been called agri-terrorists. If you save your seed that have been tested by nature and centuries, that is agri-terrorism. You unleash GMOs with viruses and bacteria and antibiotic resistance markers, that is safety. Citizens are not being allowed to know what's in their food, which is vital to food democracy. Vermont got a law in place. Corporations are suing. The state of Vermont on grounds that corporations are person. And people's freedom to know what's in their food takes away the freedom of speech of the corporation. It takes a stretch of imagination to figure all this out. But the latest, this is the most hilarious. So do you know all of you are suffering from a new disease? And the disease is called, they've just invented this word in the last few weeks, orthorexia nervosa, a pathological obsession for biological purity and healthy nutrition. <laughs> so you criminalize the farmers, you criminalize the consumer, you criminalize people wanting a life through healthy food. <laughs> now, when it becomes that bigger scope, I think they're doing us a favor. Because they're doing two things. They're connecting us all, because the farmers' attempt to criminalize farmers becomes the same as the attempt to criminalize eaters, becomes the same as the criminalization of governments acting on behalf of their people. So it's all one continuum of criminalizing actions that protect the planet and human freedom. So we are in a situation where with every plate, and if you don't fast too much, that means three times a day. And if you snack frequently, that could be 10 times a day. <laughs> but as frequently as you eat, we are making a choice about whether we are going to push the planet to dead soils, dead rivers, desertification, extinction of species, totally unstable climate. 
and people to know food because what we are getting is commodities and not food. It's non-food. They tried the other day after the 2008 um, uh, price rise in, in Indian dals became very expensive and uh, the American corporations thought they could find another market. Now they called it an I dal. And I think the I, we couldn't figure out why I. Then I realized there's iPhones, iPads, you know. And they said, oh, you know, take soya, color it yellow, sell it as an idol, everyone's going to run and eat it because everyone loves technology. And the poorest of women said, we're not going to spend 25 rupees on rubbish. Just as earlier when they tried to push GMO soya oil on us and banned our oils, and I won't go into the details, the women asked us to bring the mustard oil ba back and I did a mus mustard sa satyagraha. And, and why does soy oil become cheap? Because the US government is putting more than $200 subsidy behind every ton, and the Indian government's putting $300 to make a very costly product cheap. And behind every aspect of cheap food is our own tax money being used against us. And that's why we do need a movement, an economic democracy movement, on how our taxes are spent. And we need to move from monocultures of the mind and monocultures in our diets and monocultures in our fields to the biodiversity of species and ecosystems, the biodiversity of knowledges from our grandmothers and ancestors to our children, the knowledge of the cow <laughs> as much as the braid of grass because there's intelligence there. We need a biodiversity of ecosystems with the local, as Joel said, the home at the center, oikos, is home. Oikonomia is what Aristotle said, the art, art of living. And he had another name for what Monsanto is engaged in. He called it crematistics, the art of money making. Very different. We need a democracy at the political level, again beginning from the local. And these together create living economies, living democracies, living cultures. Either we will reclaim agriculture as a culture of the land, or we will be pushed to extinction by an agriculture that is no more agriculture, but is an extension of war against the planet and our bodies.